Okay, so, so welcome. So this is, this is the first uh, in a series of lectures on string theory. Uh, these lectures will go on at least till May or uh, next year. But depending on uh, various things, including if you are interested in them, of course, um, we might continue the subsequent semesters. Okay, so it may, might be a year and a half long. The plan for the first uh, um, plan for the first uh, part of the course, um, by first part I mean till May, uh, is to try uh, is to try, uh, is to go through a, a, a treatment of perturbative string. Okay, um, so the, the text, the main textbook, the textbook that will be most useful in this course is Kafka uh, Kulchinsky. Kulchinsky has written. Uh, uh, a couple of really nice textbooks in string theory. Um, uh, we will follow we will follow Kuczynski's book uh, mainly chapters one to four through large parts. And okay, this will be the most uh, useful single reference. Other I mean, other useful references are the book by Green Schwartz and And uh, um, uh, uh, another book that I, I, I found useful by the extreme theory was a book by Luce and Tyson. Um, through the course, we'll also follow other references, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you about them as we get to them. Okay, so uh, as far as books go, the, these will be the main, the main, uh, main references for our course. Um, okay. Uh, good. So, any organizational questions or comments before we before we start? So, the plan is to, uh, to have the classes on on, front, uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday, same time, two thirty. Okay. This Friday is no class or? Uh, this Friday we could take all of that. How about having it this Friday and then from next week to Tuesday? So we have two classes. <laughs> okay. Good. So. Uh, um, so what, what are we going to do? Well, so let me give you five minutes, a five minute spiel on why we're studying string theory. Okay. Um, as all of you know, uh, quantum theories of three of the four basic forces of nature have been successfully developed, successfully tested in accelerated experiments, and work very well. Okay. These quantum theories are uh, the quantum theory of electrodynamics and the gauge theories that govern uh, uh, weekends from forces. Yes, you do an SU3 theories. Okay. Um, uh, these theories are based on a classical Lagrangian, but we've understood how to make how to do quantum mechanics with these theories by quantizing this. Okay. Now, well before we got to understand we, we got understanding of, for instance, the classic, you know, the classical Lagrangians of the weak and strong force, we had good control over the action the classical action for, for gravity. The Einstein action was written down in the early part of the last century, many years before strong forces and weak forces were even begun to be used. And we have very good understanding of the classical physics of gravitation. Okay. Uh, in some limits, Newtonian physics, in more extreme limits, it's given by Einstein's theory of gravity. Uh, these are very well understood theories, and we we understand them very intuitive and very nice ways, uh, very well. Okay, however, you know, the, uh, as, as, as all of you know, um, the way that electrodynamics developed, first Maxwell wrote down his classical theory of electrodynamics, that was written in nicer ways at the time, and then uh, various people, starting from Dirac and then Feynman, Schwinger, Tobin, and these other people, understood how to convert that into quantum theory by quantizing the differential. Okay? So it would have been a, it's natural. Uh, it would, a natural course of events would have been that somebody would have, somebody smart would have taken the Einstein Lagrangian and quantized it. Okay, that has never successfully yet been done. That program of taking the Einstein Lagrangian and trying to make a quantum mechanical theory based on it, just by following the usual procedures of economic quantization, that some of you know it, others of you would study it when you study quantum field theory, has never successfully been achieved. Okay, there are various technical reasons for this, for this lack, for this achievement, for this lack of 
lack of achievement, which we won't try to go into at the moment. Okay? But um, um, though many people have tried, it has never this program has never successfully worked. Okay. Now, uh, what is the lesson from that? Well, of course, one possibility is that we haven't been smart enough. The right young brilliant guy will come and explain how to make a, a quantum theory that has the Einstein regarded as its classical limit, and uh, then we all be happy. At least we have a quantum theory of gravity. However, this 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 uh, the program of trying to quantize gravity has proved directly has proved so hard and has left so little insight. You know, all the attempts have tried. Okay, yeah. In my opinion, not led to any you know, very, very much. So you might think that there is another possibility here. And that other possibility is as follows. There is no such thing. Well, that, that it's just misguided effort to try to make a quantum theory of gravity by quantizing the gravity the crunch. Okay? Um, a consistent quantum theory. And an analog would be something like this. You know, in the study of the weak, in the study of the weak interactions, in the study of the weak interactions, uh, the, uh, the, there was a, a phenomenological stage in the study of that theory, in which uh, people realized that many experimental results could be uh, w could, could be obtained using four Fermi interactions. Okay. Now, if you if you if you try to write down uh, uh, the Lagrangians or some, some action which has four Fermions, the detailed contraction structure doesn't matter. Five, four, and you try to make a quantum theory based on this Lagrangian, you run into various troubles. Three, some of them are analogous to the troubles you run into in trying to try to study gravity. Or try to quantize gravity. And the the uh, the way we understood how to make a quantum theory of, of this this interaction was not by correctly quantizing the Lagrangian, but by realizing that there were more degrees of freedom than just the functions. There were, in addition, the W bosons of the weak interaction. Integrating out the W bosons in some approximate regime gives you the theory of four Fermi, this four Fermi interactions. But the theory that we know how to make sense of, the theory that is so well tested in accelerated experiments, is a theory with fermions interacting with W bosons. This is not part of the basic interaction of the theory, just a phenomenological effect of uh, interaction between integrate out some things. So, in that case, the lesson was that we should try to make quantum theory based on this action. We should instead look at a larger system which you can understand and make consistent and when you take the appropriate limit of that larger system, it recovers the physics of this of this phenomenological model. Okay? So that's, there's, there's a second possibility that at least that at least most consistent quantum theories of gravity. You know, perhaps there's some well, okay, we'll, we'll get to that at the end of this course. But, but that at least most consistent quantum theories of gravity should be thought of as larger systems, systems with degrees of freedom that go beyond the graviton. But that, for some reason, when you go to appropriate limits, the appropriate limits will be low energies. Okay, reduces to the, uh, to, to the physics of gravity. So this is the second possibility uh, in, in the game. Okay, now string theory is uh, an attempt, well, is, uh, is a formalism that implements possibility number two. Okay? It is a consistent, as far as we can tell, consistent quantum theory that has many, many more degrees of freedom than just the graviton. Okay? But that has low energies, it reduces to a theory of gravitons effect, uh, interacting with some small amount of power. Okay? It, the, within the string theory, it seems clear oh, that e, all of the statements that I'm making are statements that, at various points in the history of the development of the field, have been challenged. Some of these challenges have come very recently, two, three months ago. So, everything I'm saying is based on current understanding, which may turn out to be wrong next week <coughs> from all this in. Huh? But, 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 but as far as we understand, uh, if we look at string theory and we take the low energy effect of action, the action of gravitons interacting with the other stuff, there is no sense in which you can make a consistent quantum theory just out of those fields. You need all the fields of string theory to make it all work. Yet, the effect of 
dynamics at low enough energies is that of gravity. Okay? So this is the, the, the program that string theory uh, implements. Okay? And it's the program that we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to study uh, in this course. Okay. Now, one or two uh, comments, one or two more, it's just placement comments before we start the day. The first thing I want to emphasize is that string theory, as you will see as we go along, is in some sense badly named. Firstly, the string part of that name is not entirely accurate. Secondly, the theory part of the name is not, not entirely accurate. You know, strings happen to be just some of the excitations within this theory that we have Okay? But also, the, the statement that it's a theory is a little inaccurate, uh, in, my, in my opinion. Especially, you know, for from the point of view of the experimentalist, string theory is more of formalism than theory. Okay. As we will see, string theory will build it up as a theory, but it will turn out to many, many different vacuum states. The physics about each of these vacuum states will be inequivalent. It, you know, a low energy observer sitting in one of these, vac in these different vacuum states will see completely different physics. These, where you are in the space of vacua, from the point of view of a low energy experimenter, is like parameters. So what's String theory will turn out to do is to build a whole class of different effect, low energy theorems. Okay? So, in some sense, it can be thought of, in my opinion, it in fact be more accurately thought of uh, as a formalism rather than a theory. Okay? So, it's a, a formalism within which we, it will prove possible to build consistent quantum theories of gravity. Okay? And we're going to study this formalism. The second, the, the, the second thing I want to say uh, on immediately is that, as I've already alluded to, it will turn out that the string formalism will be able to build thousands, you know, at, well, an infinite number of uh, uh, consistent quantum theories of gravity. Okay? So in that sense, string theories of formalism, it's like quantum field theory. You can't ask, what is the predict, does quantum field theory reproduce the hydrogen atom? That statement makes no sense, because quantum field theory is formalism. A particular quantum field theory does, does reproduce the hydrogen, the physics of the hydrogen. Okay? In the same sense, string theory, at least in, our current in my, my current understanding of the subject, uh, in my opinion, is a formalism. <coughs> and uh, the question, which is of deep interest to all of us, but does string theory explain the real world, is as he, as he posed, is the question of does quantum field theory reproduce the spectrum of the hydrogen? You, you can't string theory by itself not reproduce very well. It's a particular implementation of string theory. A particular theory within the string formalism that may or may not be the theory of the real world. Okay? Now, all of us who study string theory hope that that's the case. But we have no, no, not at all, no experimental evidence, no, no terribly pressing reason yet to believe. No overwhelming reason yet to believe. But that is true. Okay? So string theory is a formalism. What it has its successes so far have been that it has been a consistent formalism within which it has proved possible to make consistent quantum theories of gravity. A whole zoo of quantum theories of gravity. And in my opinion, it's the only successful attempt by, by human beings to make successful, successful quantum theories of gravity. But what I mean by quantum theory of gravity, what I mean is theory that is consistent and quantum mechanical and that low energies is effectively described by gravity. I don't mean something that implements quantization of the lines and attraction. Okay? So, all the successes, and we'll see many of them as we study this course, all the many interesting things that emerge in the study of string theory, all the successes have been formal successes. They have been successes about relating one formalism, like gauge theory, to another formalism, like gravity. And understanding thing, you know, understanding wonderful things about these various formats. But string theory has had no concrete success yet in implementing the theory of the real world. So which vacuum string theory, if any, is the theory of the real world? It's at the moment completely unknown. Okay? And there's no there is no overwhelming experimental reason to believe that any of these is the theory of the real world. Okay? So string theory is has been successful as, as formalism for quantum gravity. <coughs> it is also <coughs> a as phenomenology. 
you know, and, and for matters of within the week, for, for phenomenology can be placed. It's the only, in my opinion, the only formalism that we know of within which you can try to make the theory of the real world. It's the only formalism that has both quantum mechanics and gravity. Okay? But uh, it has had no concrete success yet in reproducing the real world. So you should not think that all the calculations between our calculations about the theory of the real world yet. We don't know that that's true. Okay, so these, these are the general placement remarks I wanted to make about string theory. Any questions or comments before we continue to do today? Please. What sort of background uh, would you recommend coming into this course? Okay, so um, the things that would be essential are an understanding of quantum mechanics, a, a very good understanding of quantum mechanics. That, that is what would be essential. Okay, things that would be useful is exposure to general, the general theory of relativity and exposure to quantum field theory. Okay? Neither of these would, would be totally essential, but they would be useful. Good. Other questions or comments? Fantastic. Okay, so let's start. So, um, in the next 20 lectures or so, what we're going to try to do is to undertake a quantum. Okay, so one more, one more situation remark about this. Okay, uh, as you will see, the basic idea of string theory is that the various particles that make up the real world, well, this, this is an inroad into string theory, come by quantizing the motion of a little string. Just like quantum field theory can be thought of as arising from quantizing the motion of particles. Okay? So, um, the next several lectures, at least 20 or so, uh, will, occupy, uh, will occupy us with the process of consistent quantizations of strings moving around in space time. Okay? But before we get to that, before we get to that, let's, let's back up a little bit and ask how we can quantize the motion of a bosonic relativistic particle moving in flat space. Okay? So, we'll, our situation is our, let's say, uh, d minus 1 comma 1, uh, by which I mean we're in flat space with d minus 1 spatial dimensions at one time. And I want to understand how to quantize the motion of a relativistic particle uh, moving around in the stack. Now, so in order to do that, what I want to do is to write down an action. So s is equal to something. Okay? But even before I talk about the action, I have to talk about the variables. What are the variables? Okay, now all of you know how to how to think about this, because this is the kind of question you ask in quantum mechanics. Understand? The variables of the problem are the position of the particle. It's a bosonic scalar particle with no internal difference. So the position of the particle, let's call it xi of t, is the standard set of variables uh, in quantum, that you use in trying to make quantum mechanics. However, in using these variables, you break manifest Lorentz in variables <coughs> because you choose variables to be space and t to be a parameter. Lorentz in variables mixes space and time coordinates, so this doesn't look like the kind of thing you want to do if you want to preserve manifest Lorentz in variables. Okay? So, unmotivated as it may sound at the beginning, unmotivated as it may sound at the beginning, okay, let us start by trying to make a formalism in which the variables are not xi of t, but x mu, where mu runs of all spatial as well as the time coordinate, as a function of tau. Now, immediately you should ask me what the hell is tau. Okay. There is nothing else in the problem, the space and time. So tau is a fictional parameter. And as soon as we set up the problem in this way, we must make sure that we set it up in a way that is independent of what tau is. Okay? So any action we write down for these, these variables, yeah? Any action we write down for these variables has to have the proper has to have the property that it is invariant under the following transformation. Tau is equal to f of tau. By which I mean the action function written as a function of x of tau prime, take the same functional form as the action function written as a function of x of tau. Okay? Because there's no tau, there's going to be some parameter that tells you where 
you know, Fatherman tries his off particles, some arbitrary parameter that say starts from zero and goes to one in some given process. Uh, there's nothing physical or invariant about it, so we should be able to change parameterization at will without changing physics. This is scary. Okay, so that's going to be our guiding principle. How do we write down an action? Uh, uh, we, uh, we, that's going to be our guiding principle. So let me try to write down one action that has this property. Okay, now an action. So, so, so once again, tau is some arbitrary parameter that parameterizes world lines. We want to write down an action for x mu tau. Now, how do we write down an action that does not depend on what tau is? A simple way to do that is to make our action a geometric quantity. Okay? In order to understand this, let, let, me, let me give you the example that will turn out to be what we want. Let's choose the geometric quantity of a length. So suppose I have some path parameterized by tau, let me write down an expression for the length of that path. Okay? So the length of the path is, let's say for a, for a moment, so we're working in Euclidean space, we get a minus sign right in Cousin space. But if we were working in Euclidean space, well, we know that if um, you know, there are two points and uh, the difference between uh, uh, the coordinates of these two points is dx mu, then the length between these two points is simply dx mu dx mu. Square root. The metric is 1. The identity. Okay? Now, x is parameterized by tau. So what we could do is put a d tau here and put a d tau there. But we don't really want the tau. That's just fiction. It's fake. So we multiply and divide by d tau. So we put a d tau. Okay? This object is an expression. Now I, I include the integration sign. So this object is an expression for the length of the path, uh, length of the path traversed by this particle, and is clearly independent of rescaling of, of redefinitions of, of the variable tau, because we write it without it. Is this clear? So first exercise. Okay. I want you guys to satisfy yourself as clearly as possible that if I write if tau is equal to f of tau prime. Okay? You make this change of variables, rewrite this action as a function of tau prime, you get the same, you get you get the same expression as, as a function of tau prime. It's obvious. It's obvious we've, we've done it, but I want you to convince yourself. Okay? So this action expresses geometric quantity, the parameters are fake. So it has a problem that we want. Okay. Now let's move to Euclidean space. Uh, to Minkowski space. Okay, and write down the action that will actually be of interest. This any transformation for it does not singular to go be right? I mean, yes, yes. So. You will have it. That's right. Uh, you will have uh, it's uh, not a multi value. That, that, that's correct. So, um, uh, so, so Suresh's, uh, Suresh's comment is a good one. Uh, the transformation will have to have the property that tau is equal to x of tau prime is a one to one function. It doesn't go back. Uh, that's true. You see, basically, the point is that suppose you take. Um, uh, Suppose, suppose you take this following path, and then you choose a parameterization that does this. Then that changes the length of the path. You see, along this parameterization, you're not computing the length of the path. You're computing the length of the line that you're traversing, which is larger than the length of the path. Okay? So you want one honest variable that really parameterizes the path. Okay? And then all variable changes that will be allowed will be honest variable changes of that honest variable, namely one to one. Good point, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, you'll see that that's needed because there's a square root here which will bring out an absolute value if you try to do this exercise. You'll have an absolute value here that will have to cancel with a number there. So that absolute value, uh, that, that, that's what we'll read. Okay, good. So now let's move to Minkowski space. So uh, we want to do the same thing. Space, except we were really interested in parts that are time like. Because that's how particles move. Okay? So, uh, in our metric conventions, let me immediately set up a metric convention. Our metric convention will be minus plus that. <coughs> so, time has negative, time like vectors have negative length. Okay? So, in our metric convention, we need to include a minus sign inside the square root in order to be taking the square root of a positive quantity. Okay? 
So now metric convention, S is equal to um, uh, minus of dx mu by d tau, dx mu by d tau. And now we can put any constant we want behind this action. That doesn't change anything. It will turn out to be useful to have a negative constant, as we will see in a moment. OK, so this is the action that we will start with. The action for uh, uh, the motion of a relativistic particle, a uh, relativistic uh, scalar particle. OK, good. Is the, uh, and of course, this is the time here. OK, is this clear? Any questions, comments, or but any, 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 any discussion about what this action is? OK, good. So uh, now, see. Before we go on to the quantization of this action, let me first convince you of something you're very familiar with. Okay? So, well, we, we, one of the things we said was that the parametrization of the path should be phaseful. That is, any given value of the parameter should correspond to a single point of the path. Okay, now, if the particle always undergoes time like trajectories, classic enough, what to do, so if the particle always undergoes time like trajectories, then there's one obvious parametrization of the, of the path, namely the time. Okay, so let's, well, we could use any parametrization for tau. Let's choose from there to use time. Okay, so what do we get? The, the dx0 by d tau is 1, but uh, 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 when we contract that with the metric, it becomes minus 1, which cancels this side. So f is equal to minus m integral of 1 minus vi squared, where vi is. Okay. Now, several of you identify this and have studied already the motion of relativistic particles and know this is the famous action for the motion of a relativistic particle of mass m. Which is, for those of you who haven't, let's, let's check that at least re reproduces the non correct non-relativistic limit. In order to do that, of course, all through this course, the speed of light is 1, h crosses 1. Okay. We'll uh, reinstate it with great difficulty if we need these things. So v is v units of Okay, so let's uh, let's see if we get the right non relativistic limit. Let's expand on the square root. Uh, so this, uh, once we expand on the square root, we get minus m plus m v squared by two plus higher orders. Minus m is a constant; it doesn't affect physics. M v squared by two is the correct relativistic uh, non relativistic Lagrangian. Okay, so we've started with the Lagrangian that this was guaranteed to have the right non relativistic limit, and in fact, well, is is the famous Lagrangian for the motion of a relativistic part. Okay, good. So the starting point makes physical sense, even though it looks pretty formal. Questions, comments about this? Okay, correct. So, oh, so I, I should have said that because this course has been videoed, I'm not allowed to stray beyond this line and this line. If somebody catches me, catches me doing that, please uh, push me back. <laughs> good. Now that we've agreed that we've got a good Lagrangian. We're going to try to quantize it. Okay, how do we do that? Well, let's just implement the standard procedures of canonical quantization. So, what are our standard procedures of canonical quantization? The first thing we do is to write down this action in canonical terms. The first thing we do is to compute the canonical momentum, the canonical momentum of premium, which is del L by del x mu dot. Okay, so what's that with Lagrange? Well, what do we get? So there's a mu uh, we get m by square root of minus x mu dot x mu dot. So dot is going to denote the derivative. Tau times x mu dot. The two minus signs of cancel. Okay. Now that we have the canonical momenta, you might think that in order to make quantum mechanics, all we have to do is to replace canonical momenta by derivative operators. Okay, and coordinates by the x, the coordinate operator, and through. However, things are not quite so simple. We know that this shouldn't be so simple, because if that were true, then the answer to quantum mechanics would be an inverse space of functions of d variables. Whereas in the non relativistic limit, we know that the right answer is an inverse space of function of d minus 1 variables. We've got the wrong number of variables in the problem. So things shouldn't be so simple. We should see that somehow. 
How do we see that? We see that from the following way. You see, you look at the, uh, the momentum here, and then construct the following object. Construct phi mu phi. Okay, so what do we get? Um, uh, what do we get? We get m squared x mu dot x mu dot divided by square root of minus x dot mu x dot mu. Okay? So, so this thing is minus m squared into uh, sorry? Square root of square root of square root of square root was not there the the denominator so only this. Oh, thank you. Lovely. Lovely. So we just get minus minus n squared. And therefore, we say that the mu p mu plus n squared is equal to zero. Okay. Now what have we found? You see, from the formal point of view, p mu's were canonical, were canonical momenta of our action. They label points in phase space. Points in phase space give you all allowed initial conditions of classical mechanics. This, this equation is telling you that not every assignment of momenta is an allowed state in your theory. The momenta have to lie on a specified surface. Uh, people who study these uh, uh, canonical quantization uh, with uh, with such relations, between, you know, in the standard implementation of canonical quantization, x mu and p mu are completely independent variables. There are no relations between them. Okay, we run into a system in which that's not true. The momenta are constrained to base integration. Okay, so how do we implement the quantization of such a system? Now, this deep general theory. Uh, developed by Dirac uh, to study the co uh, co uh, quantization of canonical systems. And I really read that there's a little book he's written on lecture notes in quantum mechanics, Yeshiva, Yerisha, something like that, lecture notes in quantum mechanics, which is re a real pleasure to read. So, if any of you are interested, I really strongly recommend that book to you. But we're not going to go into some deep theory, we're just going to follow one of this. Okay. So, how, how, do, we do, how do we do the, uh, do, do the implementation of the system? Well, uh, the, Actually, something else we should do before, before. Okay, so we we'll notice that we got this constraint, <coughs> but okay, let's ignore that and proceed for a moment. The next thing we do is to compute the Hamiltonian in the system. Okay, so we want to compute the Hamiltonian. Right. So the Hamiltonian in the system is p mu h mu dot minus n. Can anyone quickly do the algebra and see what this gives us? Good. Can you see why? Can somebody give me a reason for that for it being zero? Very good. Hamiltonian generates shifts in tau, but tau is a fake variable, so shifts in tau should do nothing. And a more mathematically technical level, you see, the Lagrangian itself, okay, the Lagrangian itself was a homogeneous function of degree 1 in derivatives. Okay? Therefore, this quantity is guaranteed to be the Lagrangian once again. Right? Because for any homogeneous function, you add the derivative of a variable times variable on that function, you get degree times the function. Okay? So, this was guaranteed to be 0. So, uh, you see, we, we run into a system with two odd properties. First, we can have a term in Spanish. Secondly, the system has constraints. These two properties, of course, are related. Okay. Now, um, if you if you were a master of Dirac's techniques of quantization, um, you you would understand that his prescription for the dealing with this system would be the following intuitive prescription, which I'm just going to tell you. The following intuitive prescription, which says, go ahead and quantize your theory, ignoring the constraint, but Implement the constraint as an operator equation that physical states have to satisfy. Okay? This is a so-called first class constraint. Uh, I'm not even going to explain what that means. And uh, uh, this, is the, this is the general procedure for quantizing systems. First class constraints. 
Okay? It, you don't have to know the general theory. It's some, some, some formal bunk um, You know, as always, what you're doing when you have a classical theory and you're trying to make quantum mechanical theory is to make any quantum mechanical theory that is consistent and have the right classical limit. So if you find a procedure that works, it's as good as anyone else's procedure, no matter how fancy it is. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. We're trying to find, we're going to find a, a procedure that works. Okay? Um, so I'm clear this set. So let's see. Oh. Okay, so the the uh, 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 so so firstly, uh, suppose we just did the quantization. So what's the answer to the Hilbert space? The answer to the Hilbert space is functions of x mean with the norm we'll discuss in a moment. Okay? The answer to the inverse space is function of x mu. Okay? But you you might say, well, hold on, if ordinary quantum mechanics, we have functions of our variables and also time. In this case, should we say functions of x mu and tau? The answer is no, because the Hamiltonian is zero. So Hamiltonian is what changes the state as you move in time. The state doesn't change, so it's not a function of time, it's just a function of x. So this is our Hilbert space. It normalizes the function for the given norm, which we'll discuss in a moment. Okay? Now, not all weight functions of this form are physical. Only those that satisfy this constraint. What does it mean for a weight function to satisfy the constraint? Well, we know P mu is equal to minus I uh, uh, del mu. I've almost wrote an h cross there, which would be a cardinal there. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's minus i del mu. So let's put that in. So the constraint that we have is psi of x mu acted on by minus i squares to minus one del mu del mu plus x squared and psi of x is equal to zero. Okay. Now, what sense is this making? In order to see what sense this is making, let's try to go back and use a much more lowbrow approach to the quantization of the system. Let's go back to the Grange, s is equal to minus m square root of 1 minus gi squared. Xi squared, where we chose a particular implementation of what tau is. Okay? How do we do the quantization of this system? Well, if we did the quantization of the system, we would have the variables are just xi. Okay? So what is pi? pi is equal to uh, x, m xi dot divided by square root of 1 minus xi dot squared. And the Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian is equal to where we can compute it, but you know what the answer is going to be. And pi squared plus x squared. When you get the answer, this is something you're all familiar with. Now, if we were to work out the quantum mechanics of this system, what we would have is the wave. Oops. Oh. <laughs> this is not good. So what we would have is the Hilbert space is a function of square integrable functions of xi, but the Hamiltonian is not zero. So it's also a function of time, <laughs> and it's not. And this wave function of the showing it. What is the Schrodinger? Schrodinger is minus i d by dt, plus i d by dt, plus, plus i d by dt, uh, on psi is equal to h of psi, h is this, so that's minus del i squared plus m squared on psi. Now let's take this equation and square it. Act a little i d by dt again on the left hand side, here's the fact that so we square the operator. So what do we get? We get minus d by d, d squared psi is equal to uh, minus del i squared plus m squared on psi. Okay? Which is the same thing as uh, in our sign convention, minus uh, plus d mu d mu minus m squared on psi is equal to zero. Which is minus the sequence. So that's right. Okay. So you see that our these two methods of quantization have 
given us the same answer. They've given us the same answer by from in different ways. You see, the constraint, the paper working with constraint in our first way of quantizing was simply the Schrodinger equation that described time evolution in the second, more physical, more crude, but more safer way of quantizing. Okay? So we've got the same answer working in both ways. And I hope this has given you a feel for what these constraints do. The problem was, you see, what was the problem? The problem was that we started with too many variables. We pretended that our variables of the system were the time of the particle as well as the position. That was not true. What the system told us was that not every state was physical. Implementing that condition gave us an equation on wave functions. That equation is what re replaced the Schrodinger equation for the more physical wave quantizing. And there was no Schrodinger equation in the less physical wave quantizing because I had to this. It's just clear. We've got two, uh, two, uh, um, uh, we've got two, uh, uh, two ways of quantizing the theory. Uh, we've got two ways of quantizing the theory uh, that give us the same result. Well, give us almost the same result so far because I've not discussed the scalar product. Okay. Now, uh, um, in the first, okay, I mean, this is not going to be, you know, when we do it properly, it's really we do it really properly, so I'm just going to make a couple of throwaway comments about the scalar product, just so, so that we can you know. Um, the wave function that we naturally get using, well, so let's, now that we've seen this, let's divide our board into two, into two sections. There's physical, so S is equal to minus M, one minus V I squared, and then S is equal to minus M squared to minus X squared. Okay? We got a wave function and doing the quantization here, Let's give it a different name. So let's call, let's say the wave function is equal to phi. So I'm sorry, I called it psi here, but I'll change it. Okay, what is the natural norm for scalar products in this system? Well, we know, we've all studied quantum mechanics. There's no ambiguity. If we work in momentum space, then the norm is just, you know, after some two pi's which we want to obsess about, it's a uh, Phi of phi star of p times psi of p d d minus one of p. This is equal to phi psi. Okay, it's just the usual thing we do. The usual measure of quantum mechanics. Okay. What about normal wave functions in this way of quantizing things? You see, in that way of quantizing things, everything, if the, 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 the natural thing you would think about. You see, everything was a function of d then. So you might be tempted to write, well, d, d, p. Um, oh, uh, now I call this psi. Let's call this phi prime. Sorry, sorry. Phi is a way function to get to this point. I think psi is the same. Okay. You might think that the natural thing to do is to say psi star p, psi of p. Except that makes no sense. Because we know that this psi satisfies the constraint. That it only has non-zero support on those momenta that obey the equation p squared plus x squared equals zero. So while you can say this, this would just be zero. So let's get, enhance the contribution from that surface um, and let's do it in the Lorentz invariant manner. So we just put it there. Well, it's going outside the... Oh, that's fine. Uh, very nice and satisfactory. It's clearly not independent. It's a nice norm. But I'm going to leave it as an exercise for you to check. But these two norms are only the same. Are the same only if these two wave functions are not quite equal. In fact, the conversion that works, well, can somebody do it in real time? Well, the conversion that works is that sum of p uh, is equal to square root of and 
All right, I'm going I'm, I'm to leave this as an exercise. We list these exercises, by the way. Um, so the first exercise was to uh, explicitly demonstrate invariance of interaction. The second exercise was to check that this variable transformation equates these two norms. Okay. Um, ha having done that, you see, uh, these are the same systems. So it's the same system as the wave function is not quite the same. Same up to uh, uh, a little bit. Is, this was a, a, a by the way aside, which we'll understand very well when we start string theory, so don't obsess about it. Okay, good. That's all I wanted to say about these two ways of quantizing the system. Any questions or comments? Fine. So, before we turn to the quantization of string theory, I want to talk about one or two slightly. I, 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 I want to kill this system. Very simple system. We know everything there is to know about it. But I want to the process of quantization of the system from many different ways, points of view, so that when you see the same kind of uh, when we do more complicated things like quantizing the string, uh, you will have many options in your hand and use the one that's most convenient. Okay? So it's not that I expect to learn any new physics about a free particle. We know everything there is to know about it. But anyway, we're gonna kill this problem today. So let's let's get it done. So, the next thing I'm going to do is to take the action, the fancy action, and make it even more fancy. Right. So the fancy action is minus m square root of x mu dot squared minus. And, you know, while this is a perfectly legitimate action, um, it's a little odd, it's a little ugly, it just has this horrible square root. No, when you're dealing with something as simple as a free particle, you can deal with ugliness, okay? But when you do things that are more complicated, the ugliness will not kill you. Okay. So, question, can you take this 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 action and rewrite it in a way that's classically equivalent that makes it look pretty? Okay? <laughs> Answer yes, and let me do it. Okay, so I'm gonna to have to look up the science. Suppose you consider the following s is equal to m by 2, uh, x mu dot, x mu dot by e minus. And now you're going to ask me what is e, and I'm, I say, well, it's a new variable. So instead of dealing with a system with d variables, we're now dealing with a system with d plus 1 variables. Okay, we decide to be happy. I mean, if you go from d minus 1 to d, who's going to, who's going to stop if you're going to? That's what. Okay. So now this looks like an odd system. This looks like an odd system. So uh, before we... Uh, uh, let, let us check that this system has something to do with that system. Okay. In order to do that, what we're going to do is to notice that it's very simple to solve for the equations of motion of E. Basically because the, uh, the, the action has no derivatives in time with respect to E. Okay. So the equations of motion are totally local in star coordinates, it can easily be solved. So let's write down the equation of motion of E. So the equation of mo motion for E is minus 1, that comes from differentiating this guy, minus 1 over H squared, that comes from differentiating this guy, in x mu dot x mu dot is equal to 0. Okay? So that tells you that x mu dot x mu dot uh, is equal to minus, so minus of this is equal to e squared or E, which by convention we choose to be a positive number, is minus x mu dot. Very good. Now, uh, right. You have to keep your wits about you with minus signs, otherwise you might think it's Okay, so now let's substitute this. Okay. So we substitute this back into the action, we have f by 2, s is equal to f by 2, and then we got this x mu dot x mu dot, but we write that as minus of minus x mu dot x mu dot. And then there's divided by the square root, so this is this. And then we've got another minus, minus square root of x mu dot x mu dot. Minus. So the action 
the system was simply equal to m minus m square root of minus x mu dot. Okay. So it's the same action. It's the same action once you solve for e using its equation of motion as the previous system. Okay. For those of you who feel uncomfortable about uh, you know, working with actions once you've sort of put in equations of motion, solutions to equations of motion, something you, in such certain situations, should be uncomfortable about doing. I encourage you to check that the equations of motion or that you get from these two actions are the same. Okay? E is simply determined once you know what x is. Once you plug that into the equations of motion of x, you get the same equation of motion as before. Okay? Classically, these systems are just identical. Okay? The reason we've done this ugly business by introducing a d plus one -th variable in the system with actually d minus one variables is that the action looks much simpler than this. Okay. Uh, uh, the equation of e, but it just demands that the momenta are the same for both uh, actions. So the momenta here is like x dot, x dot by e, basically. And if you wanted to be x dot by root of x, x dot, then you would have, the, wouldn't that give the value of e? Sorry, sorry I, I didn't understand. So, so you write down this action in with d plus one variables, the amount of the momentum that you get from the action for the free particle the same as the momentum from the other action. Yes. Well, that it's, the value good, I understand it's a consistency check for that had to work. Hmm. But it can well be that that is the value of E determined by dynamics. Huh. Which we've checked. So so the way I would word what you're saying hmm. is that now that we've done it, hmm. we can plug into the equation for the momentum for this, and we'll find the same. Everything will be the same. Hmm. Once once you plug it. So why should we actually undo for the load by it back in by that thing? I mean, if you have increased uh, one parameter in the space of function hours, and you're setting that, fixing that, but once you're fixing that parameter, you're reducing the number of parameters by one. Yeah, well, we should yeah, we should in general be uncomfortable about uh, about plugging uh, solutions into an action because you get equations of motion from an action by performing all the possible variations of that. Okay, but if you see that equation as a constraint, so you're again reducing all the parameters by one, so you're going back to one. Right. So there's some situations in which in which it's correct, okay? but there are other situations in which it's not correct. Okay? There's an analogous question you could ask. Okay? It's not the same question, but it's analogous, and all of us are familiar with that. Okay? So let me remind you of that. The analogous question is when can you plug in a gauge condition into an action? Okay, suppose you decide to work with gauge A0 equals 0 into an action. And you plug that into the action, all the equations of motion that you will get from that action by varying with respect to AI are correct equations of motion. But you miss an equation of motion. Okay, you miss an equation of motion because there was the variation of a with respect to A0, which you really does know, which you missed. So that's the kind of thing you have to worry about. In this situation, I completely agree with this correct. It's fine, you should be checking that. Yes. Okay. But uh, now let's move on. So now we want to make a quantum theory corresponding to this action. How do we do that? Well, we just follow the usual canonical procedure. We follow the usual canonical procedure, and uh, 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 what does that give us? Well, the first thing we see is that there's no derivative, there's no time derivative, there's no x dot uh, tau derivative of e. So p e is zero. Okay. What about the canonical momentum? Like, okay. So p mu was what? Well, we get m x mu dot by, by e. Okay. Now, uh, okay, now what? Now, the next thing we see is that if we compute, um, okay, so this is already a constraint. That, uh, uh, that momentum uh, conjugate to a particular variable is identically zero, is telling you it can't be a normal phase space. You have to be in some phase space. So you have at least one constraint in that system. Okay? Uh, and I think that you might have thought, you might have thought that's it. There are no other obvious constraints in the system. However, there is one more constraint in the system which is more subtle than the initial constraint. How do we see that? In order to see that, let's do the handle. The Hamiltonian of our system is what? Well, the Hamiltonian of our system is x mu dot b mu minus the dungeon. Okay? So, uh, so that's going to be uh, e times p mu p mu by 2m 
plus m squared by uh, and there's an e outside there as well by bracket. So it's a part that's constant, just reverse the sign. And this part is exactly like the standard Lagrangian with him replaced by FA. Okay, good. So, you remember that we had a constraint in our system that V equals equal to zero. But, this is a constraint on phase space. But now we have a Hamiltonian that is not zero in our system. So suppose we start with an object that meets this constraint. If we act on it with time variation, we act on it with the, uh, the operator that generates time variation, it could leave this constraint space. That would be bad because we should demand that our particle always sits in the constraint manifold. Okay? So let's check whether it does or not. How do we check that? The way to check that is to check what the, what the Poisson bracket of PE constraint is the but that's very simple because the only thing that it does not have zero Poisson bracket with is E. Okay? So this Poisson bracket is proportional to is proportional to P mu P mu plus M squared. So it's not zero unless P mu P mu plus M squared is zero. That's the second constraint we have to impose on our system in order to have consistent dynamics. Okay, now you can check that that's it. Basically, because P mu, P mu plus M squared itself commutes with, uh, uh, with the Hamiltonian. Yes. Obviously. Okay? So there's nothing else. The system is closed here. We impose these two constraints. P e is equal to zero. P mu, P mu plus M squared equal to zero. Nothing else to do. Okay. Now let's make our, our quantum mechanics for this system. Okay, so now we make a quantum mechanics of the system. Uh, states are um, states are functions of x mu of e and tau. However, once we impose the constraint, the Hamiltonian is zero. So states are not functions of tau. And once we impose the constraint, the constraint what's the, what's the constraint? P is equal to zero. That's d by d e minus i d by d e of psi of x mu e i zero. This is the way you e is equal to e. And therefore, uh, the solution to this is make functions that are functions of x mu. Imposing the second constraint now reduces this problem exactly to the one before. Okay? So, let's see how, how this works. We start with a system with d plus one variable, but for each additional unphysical variable that we imposed, we had an additional constraint. And that knocked it back down to the right answer when we did things carefully. Okay, questions or comments about our third way of quantizing the system? Fine. So, just to show you what, what, what varieties of quantization are possible, we're going to do a fourth way, but I promise you that's it. <laughs> this fourth way of doing this quantization is a poor man's quantization. Sorry, so Please. is there a general rule you could extract from this? Given d variables, you want to remove r of them, just put d by dr of psi r x mu r equal to zero. That's probably what you seem to be doing here. For example, in the first way, you had psi as a function of x mu comma tau, I mean t, for example. And you well, the constraint equation was d by d of psi equal to zero at the end of the day. Right. Now well, that was not the constraint, just the Hamiltonian that had to be zero. That's right, but uh, uh -huh. that's just a Hamiltonian, that's right. And the constraint then generated uh -huh. true dynamics in the system. I don't think you want to make very general rules. You know, what, hey, 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 but please go. What, 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 what? No, 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 oh, okay, fine, but that's different from the, UK. oh, no, I mean, it's just something that, so you just demand, for example, that uh, you stay on the space of constraint when you're doing time evolution, right. and that gives you back the first constraint equation. That gives you, that gives you the, yes, back the first constraint. You see, the constraint that PE was equal to zero oh. was not consistent under time evolution unless it was also true that P squared plus N squared. Oh, so there's no consistent way of doing the quantization, this constraint quantization, mm -hmm. unless you impose both constraints. So demanding the equation motion from both actually be the same at every instant of time, essentially. 
Is not this statement that P equal to zero always? Because P equal to zero is a necessary condition for both actions to be the same. Right? P, P equal to zero. Well, it came out of the equation of motion. Oh, I see. So it's not. Yeah, you see, there's nothing you're putting by hand. Uh -huh. Okay. We, we do, we're doing quantization. We get, we're following the rules. We find a constraint. Mm -hmm. And we want, we, we want to impose a condition that the constraint is in there in another time. Okay. You know, there's nothing arbitrary. Mm -hmm. You just follow our nose. This is the answer here. We always do things that are sensible. You land up, land up in the answer. Thank you. Okay, good. So let's do the last one. This last one is four lines root to one Please. In the previous way, uh, we didn't have to bother about the fact that the Hamilton was identically zero was an obvious constraint. But in this case, but it was not a constraint. Just only the time evolution is true. Yeah. But now H is not zero identically. At least it's identically. not zero identically. However, you're only dealing with states on which the Hamiltonian matches. So time evolution for physical states is true. Okay. Great. Last, last way. I hope we're not uh, pushing this line further. <laughs> okay. Last way. The last method of quantization is the same action that we started. Okay, but there's I don't want all this formal nonsense. I don't want all this formal nonsense. Let me just follow my notes. So the action is this: minus plus m x mu dot x mu dot by e minus e. Ah, uh, down. One over. Okay, and now uh, I want you to notice. Suppose, uh, suppose you make the, sub the substitution x of tau is equal to x prime of f of tau. And e of tau is equal to, well, prime makes it sound like there, well, tilde. E tilde uh, of f of tau. Df by Okay? So I've got a set of variables and I rewrite the action with this variable change. Okay? Uh, as exercise number three, well, these are two minute exercises. Okay? I want you to check that this action can be rewritten as m by 2 is still uh, dot mu. Tilda dot mu by e tilda minus e tilda. Yeah, with, with an appropriate redefinition of what this tau is. This 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 would really be effective. Yes, some some some. So isn't that dt by d f tau? What? Isn't that d uh, for this the e, e transformation? This is d, d f by oh that's it. D f by d f by d f. Okay. What I'm saying is that this action here has a reparametrization invariance in it. Okay. That that if you change the coordinate. Okay. Uh, go on. Why is there DFT now again? Well, this is a rule, a transformation rule, under which the action is embedded. Uh, we see why, in a, you see, as we will see in more detail very soon, E is playing the role, E is playing the role of a metric on this one dimensional world. Okay? Uh, more precisely, it's playing the role of a square root of a metric on this one dimensional and this, this factor is representing the transformation property of the square root of a metric under the coordinate change. Yeah, but like naively, we treated E as just a variable in the previous year of quantization. So if I were to do this fourth year of quantization myself, I wouldn't have put that df by d now. I would have just done the same kind of thing for x till x and, but e, that would have been and I wouldn't have got the right answer. 
know that the, at the moment all I'm asking you to do is to observe that there is an invariance of the action. If you didn't make this variable change, you would have got a different action. And that doesn't tell you anything. Right? Okay? What, what does tell you something is when you do find an invariance of the action. But, but there's no way to see it. Up front, that you have to put that here. Well, you know, the way to do it is to think about the solution to, it, uh, to the equation of motion. E, remember, was square root of minus x mu dot x mu dot. Okay? So now if you make this variable change on x and ask what variable change it induces on e, you get this. Okay, so it is the only consistent. Uh, I mean, or you could rewrite the other direction as s as a p e times d dot d table. Right, right. Know, so. Good. So, it's, it's, it's the same thing. So, e times d tau must be an invariant. That's what he's saying. Okay, good. So, how, however, you see it, we, we, we've discovered that this action has a reparameterization invariance under a certain you know, change of our variables. Now, this reparameterization invariance, as we talked about right at the beginning, right, is just a change in the labeling of your path. Change in the labeling of your path, and therefore there's a gain symmetry. So, for so those of you who are not familiar with the term gain symmetry, what do I mean? What I mean by this is, uh, is it gain symmetry is the word used to describe two apparently inequivalent descriptions of the same physical state. Okay, what is the physical state under consideration? Last physical state. This is the physical solution is the path of the particle in space time. You make two different parametrization of the same path, you have different functions, x mu of tau, but it's the same solution. Okay? So if you're dealing with bad variables or redundant variables, it often happens that two different functions describe the same physical thing. Any situation in which that happens uh, is referred to in physics as a situation enjoying the gates. Okay? So what we have here is a reparametrization invariance, and the reparametrization invariance is a gain symmetry mass system. Okay? Now, one way of dealing with systems with gain symmetry is just to fix the gauge. So that is to say that, well, there are many different functions that describe the same physical state. So let me, in the space of gauge orbits, you know, choose some condition that cuts each gauge orbit exactly once. Choose one function per state. So put a condition on the functions that I'm looking at, such that this condition chooses just exactly one, uh, picks out one function per equivalence orbit. Okay? Now, without thinking too much about whether it's when and whether it's possible, because this is not our main job, we're not here in the context of particle. Uh, well, let's, let's try to fix it. You see, because E changes with F this way, you might think, and it's possible, and we won't even investigate that too, too carefully. Uh, let's try to set E is equal to 1. E was positive, then, right? What, what was it on a solution? Somebody remember? Square root, yes, so it was positive. So let's set E to 1. Okay? That is going to define our gauge choice. Once we've done that, actually, it's very simple. S is equal to m by 2 x tilde mu dot x tilde mu by 1 minus 1. Now this looks like a lot of the actions, very simple, it's like non-realist mechanics. <laughs> so you might think, well, let me do my quantum mechanics by making this choice of gauge, working in this gauge, and doing my quantization. Okay? So let's see what we get when we do that. What we get is that p mu is equal to m x mu dot, and that h is equal to m um, p mu p mu plus m squared <laughs> by 2. 2 m. Now, this is the first time that we've done something. You see, this fixing gauge is slightly fishy thing to do, as we discussed a moment. We've done something fishy and we've ended up with a fishy answer. We've ended up with a fishy answer because 
Now our wave functions, and this quantization is a function of d variables. And the actual neutron zero. So the wave functions are actually apparently functions of d plus one variables. Oh, this looks bad. Looks wrong, but there's something that's even worse. Let's write this out in detail. This is equal to minus p0 squared plus pi squared plus n squared by 2. And now you see that the Hamiltonian that we have is a crazy Hamiltonian. This is the unbound of What we mu is one of mission operators. Square of an original operator, that's negative. So we've, we've been a, a ended up with a crazy system, a system that has no ground state. Okay? Uh, so what have we done wrong? What have we done wrong and how can we fix it? Somebody tell me what we've done wrong and how can we fix it? We substituted the gauge into the action. This is very similar to the, uh, to the discussion we had about substituting a 0 equal to 0 into the action. How do we fix it up? See what? Exactly. What have we missed when we substitute the gauge of the action? What we miss is the equation of motion with respect to varying, with respect to the thing that we substitute. So if we supplement this action okay, with the equation of motion from E, and in that equation of motion, then set E equals 1, then we'd be okay. But what was the equation of motion from E? The equation of motion from E was. Um, x mu dot x mu dot the minus divided by 1 because e is 1 minus 1 equals 0 which you can easily see is the same it's not good over p u p plus n squared ok so if we just did the naive thing the naive Think of substituting the gauge into the action, but we remember to look at the equation of motion from the degree of freedom that we've eliminated and impose that as a constraint. Then we get the right answer. Because now we're back to our second. However, I can't remember which is the way of what there is it first. Maybe the first way. Okay? So this is a useful thing to keep in mind. You see, this problem was so simple that we could carry out any way you wanted to quantize it all in five, each in five minutes. We're soon, in fact, now going to turn to a problem in which the quantization is much more complicated. And different ways of quantizing will have different degrees of complexity. So you want to choose the one that is best suited to your problem at hand, and then you have to do it right. Okay? So we have, to summarize, we have, we've had four different ways of quantizing the relativistic problem. The first way was to write out the relativistic action Right now, uh, we had d variables, the x mu's. Uh, the, there was Hamiltonian was zero, so it was not a function of tau. There was one constraint which gave us the equation, of the effective, the true equation of one. The second way was the physical way of writing this Lorentz non-invariant action, where you saw you got the same answer. The third way was introducing this auxiliary variable e and doing everything honestly, and we saw we got the same answer. The fourth way was introducing the auxiliary variable e, fixing gauge. If we did things wrong, we got the wrong answer. But if we fixed gauge, did the quantization, then imposed the constraint that came from very good respect to e, once again, we got the right answer. Okay? So we've got four different ways of working, each which give us the same, same physics. Okay? So we keep all these in mind when turning to uh, the problem we really want to study, namely how to quantize the motion of relative plastic string. Okay. So now, now uh, questions or comment, comments? This is a really good time to ask questions and comments because we're moving on to, to the next stage now. We're going to move on to the quantization of strings. So, please, discussion before you. Anything you want to discuss about what we've talked about now, please do. Yeah, Sorry, but there's no question about this stuff. I mean, can I ask something about some of the philosophical things? Please, go ahead. Okay. If you're talking about, if you're saying that string theory is a theory, it's not really a theory in the sense it's sort of talking about experiments. We're not describing the real world. Yes. I mean, what kind yeah. of experiments? Yeah. yeah. What kind of experiments do you think we should be looking at? Well, you see, what string theory is, in my opinion, and this is a big statement, but in my opinion, string theory, when we understand it completely, will turn out to be um, the correct framework for all consistent thought. Okay. So it's a framework within which consistent calculations can be simulated. Okay. 
So, um, within this framework, might, my, my prejudices will lie there in the real world, but within this framework will lie every calculation you might want. Okay, so if you want to perform the calculation of checking to see whether the angle theorem is a confining theory, it's a calculation that even fruitfully do in this framework. If you want to find the calculation of computing the viscosity of n equals the fluid that makes up n equals four Yang Mills theory, it's a calculation you can do within this framework. You see, strict theories has have have this eclectic nature about it. String theory techniques have been used in mathematics to significantly impact entire branches of mathematics. For instance, my colleague uh, uh, Indrani Biswas once estimated that if you look at a top algebraic geometry journal and ask which of the papers that are written there today, what fraction of the papers written there today could not have been written had string theory not existed, the answer would be about 30%. That's a big impact of a field. Okay? Um, uh, people who are trying to study the experiments at RIC today, heavy ion collisions, in order to model what's going on, are using crucial inputs uh, from string theory. Okay? People who, who this is much smaller, but to be such, they have an eminent condensed matter theorist they're trying to understand the dynamics about quantum phase transitions in real life system, is using calculations from string theory to help. So, at the very least, that's what string theory is. It's a calculational framework of great versatility. Okay? That can be brought to bear on many different phys physical systems. Okay. That, uh, that is at the level at which it is impacted experimentally. Will it do more? For that, we don't know. As all of you know, this big experiment, the LHC is up. It's going to get results whenever it does. Let's say in three years, we we'll, we'll know something about what's going on. If it turns out that supersymmetry is a feature of the real world, then even though supersymmetry is not a prediction, it's not a as low energy supersymmetry, it's not a necessary prediction of string theory. No, it's, the study of string theory is placed by the idea of supersymmetry emerged. First supersymmetry action was the one written down over the chain of string. So, you know, how these ideas are going to impact experiment is hard to say at the moment. The most direct way in which it might is if you find the right implementation of the real world in string theory. But even without that, the study of string theory has already had a significant impact on studying physics in various different fields. And perhaps even more so they study mathematics. And in my opinion, is likely to just keep having more. Because it's the most powerful, in my opinion, calculation and technique that human beings have hit upon. This is my, my take. Uh, other people could say different things, but this is better. Okay. Um, uh, other questions on it? Uh, you put the value for E at 1 in this over the Right. Like, would it amount like, and then we finally had to add in the constraint equation, which is not even strong. Is it the same thing as putting the determinant of the here, the variation that goes to the Well, I didn't understand. Putting what? Like, we have this VFD tau in the transformation of the tau. Right? Now, under a variation of tau, VFD tau. Right. Sorry? And saying that that uh, should be put in as the delta function into your uh, action. I, no, I don't. You know, if, if, if I understand you right, you're thinking of sort of the problem of and fixing. And the variation of gauge conditions can determine the measure of the path. We've not reached such subtle issues yet. You know, we didn't. That, that's like a small addition to what's going on. This is much more basic. So I, I don't, my, my answer is I don't think that's the same issue. Okay. Like, uh, do you think a particular value of uh, E is uh, basically cropping up from choosing a particular form for F? To, yes, you're cho fixing your retirement method. Exactly. To choose F, in fact, to choose F so that we have an eta is one for you. That says eta is one. Okay? Now, E is basically it's for the consistent. If, we were, if this were our main job, we would do a very thorough analysis when such a choice is possible, are there further redundancies. Then, as you can see, when we, do it, when we move to the word sheet of the string, which is our main study of interest, we would do a very thorough analysis of any case. But for now, we just don't want to get into this 
this thing for the next two lectures. So you know, I'm not going to worry too much about when it's possible. So there's more subtle issues we'll deal with in the system of interest. Okay, uh, the justification of this is that it works. If I mean, you know the answer, you get the right answer. You must have done right. So, mistakes are cancelled. Fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Great. Um, other questions or comments? Otherwise, we turn to study the study of stream. Good. So let's turn to our uh, to our study of stream. Oh, something I should have said, of course, is that the equation that we kept encountering, this d squared minus d squared plus m squared on the side equals zero, is of course the famous equation for the quantum mechanics of an electrostatic state of particles, Klein Gordon equation. Okay, so it's a famous thing, of course. It's a great way to study scalar fields. Uh, we get this just by quantizing the electricity particle, as you would expect. Okay, um, fine. Now, what we're going to try to do now is to quantize the motion of what's called a bosonic strip. Why, uh, what is the word bosonic mean? Well, it means, basically it means that the result of this quantization will give us particles in space-time that are only bosonic. Actually, on a more technical level, it means that on the word sheep, you'll see what that means, we'll only deal with bosons. We'll come back, we'll come back to improving this. We want to remember this real world for Made up a lot of fermions. Fermions are very interesting. But when you're doing this round one, round one, you can ignore technical complications to try to quantize a bosonic strip. Okay. So, how do we go? How do we go? So, what's a string? So, a string is an object whose world, whose history in space time is two dimensional. It's an object with a loop, but also moves in time. You can think of the world volume of the string as a little cylinder in space time. Okay? And uh, what we want to do is write down an action for the motion of the string. So an action that depends on the world volume, cylindrical world volume of the string. Okay? So, so first let's hit about some parameters. Let's choose sigma as one of the parameters. Sigma, of course, as always, we will we will never say much about the parameters, except for this one statement. Sigma will be chosen to be uh, to lie between zero and two pi. And every field will be periodic in Sigma. What we're doing by saying this is enforcing the topology of our, of our surfaces, enforcing that we're studying cylinders. So that sigma is one of our variables, everything's periodic, sigma from zero to two pi. The second variable is tau. We say nothing is tau goes minus infinity to infinity, nothing is periodic in tau. Uh, you are talking about your close strings now. At the moment does. Okay, so good. So those are parameters. What are our variables? Our variables are x mu of sigma. Okay. Once again, this is physically redundant. These variables are physically redundant. Of course. Okay, because you could trade. You could use one of the coordinates in space in some sense. In some. You can use time for tau and some other spatial, some other function of spatial coordinates for sigma. So actually, the real number of variables is d minus two. Okay, but we're not going to worry about that. We're not just going to carry out the formal quantization procedure, do it right, and get the answer out of it. Understand that we actually have a mean. That should be the result. Okay, so this, these are available. Next question: What is the action? Now, when we study the, um, the motion of particles, in order to choose the action, but well, we chose as the action a geometric quantity. That is a good thing to do because it ensured that our action was reparameterization. It's purely geometric because it's not parameters. Let's try to do the same thing for a strip. We have some geometric quantity that depends on a two-dimensional world sheet. Well, what quantities do we have in our hand? We could write down many, but let's choose the simplest one, the analog of the length of the line. The analog of that is the area of this two-dimensional surface. Okay? So let's write, write out an expression for the area of this two-dimensional surface. Well, let's once again, let's do it first in Euclidean space, then we figure out the right minus signs to go to the Okay? So how do we get an area? See, suppose we've got some world sheet, 
and we vary sigma a little bit, we move in this direction. We vary tau a little bit, we move in this direction. Okay. This vector, what was it? Well, it was delta sigma times dx mu by dc. This interstitial vector was delta tau times dx mu by dc. Okay? Now, in this little variation, how what is the area that we spent? Well, this is an elementary question. It's an elementary question which you could ask a high school student, and he would think and say, well, it's a parallel parallelogram. It's a parallelogram uh, generated by two vectors. So the area is A B times sine theta. And theta is the angle. A is the length of the first vector, B is the length of the second vector, sine is theta is the angle. Okay? But, uh, you know, we want to address this in a slightly more, write this in a more invariant way. So it would be useful for us to write this as square root of a squared, b squared, you know, 1 minus cos squared. Why is that useful? It's useful because each of these expressions can now be written as a dot product. This is a dot a, this is b dot b, and this is a dot b both in square. Okay, so the area is square root of a dot a into b dot b. Uh, minus a dot b the whole thing square. So this quantity, the quantity under the square root, is simply the determinant of a dot a, b dot b, a dot b, a dot b. Okay? And now let's remember what a and b were. a and b were these quantities. Okay? Dot means contraction of these indices. So what we concluded is that the area is square root of determinant del x mu, del alpha x mu, del theta x mu. Is it over? It's almost five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. So you understand what this matrix is. It's a matrix whose indices are alpha and beta. So two cross two matrix. And we bring this down in this nice compact way. Fine. Now, in uh, uh, we were as as we discussed, we would be interested in strings that are moving in this nice tag-like fashion. Okay. Therefore, one of the two of A and B will be a time-like vector. So, for instance, if we chose things that were orthogonal, this quantity would be negative. So, clearly, if we want to be working with, you know, Minkowski situation, we want minus sign that. And uh, uh, so finally we choose the action to be T now we've got sign we've got sign uh, minus T. So 